Ian Murray Watson is a former teacher and the founder of Door Valley Chocolates. Having retired a few years ago, Ian was inspired to write by the examples of people like Terry Pratchett and Douglas Adams, writers who create alternative realities that are believable enough to make you think. The result was Ian's debut novel, A Stitch in Time. This is a novel about nothing and about everything. It's a surreal fantasy in which sacred cows are sent flying in all directions. It's a novel about politicians, scientists, wind farms, supermarkets, and even overweight opera singers. Writing is the latest in a long line of diverse career choices for the author, who has also been a teacher, a political researcher, an amateur jockey, a musician, a software engineer, and a chocolatier. Ian joins us on this edition of the show to tell us more. Welcome to Arts Alive Books. And coming up later, we meet the ladies behind the That Was series, a range of local history books for children. But first, we welcome Ian Murray Watson to the show. Ian, you're very welcome. Thanks. All the way from the wilds of Herefordshire today? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Up to the big city? Yeah. Although you know Liverpool um, well, don't you? Because um, it's a, one of your experiences in Liverpool, which is behind the... Uh, the novel? Well, I wouldn't say that well. I mean, I can get from Lime Street Station to the Walker Gallery, and I can get from Lime Street Station to Bowl Street, where the Walker Group now meet. <laughs> but I don't know much more than that. <laughs> you mentioned the Walker Group. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, they're, they're, they're a group. I, I joined, oh, some years ago now, and I used to go up maybe once a month. to They, they meet, uh, as I said, originally at the Walker Gallery, and talk about everything and nothing. I mean, consciousness, reality, lucid dreaming, what are we here for, all the rest of it. You know, it was just interesting to meet people who'd really thought about these things and really had got something to say about them. All the big questions. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it was um, as a result of, of uh, the, these discussions and one of the big questions that uh, this, the germ of the novel emerged. Yeah, because I met other people. I met war groups got you know, associated people in, in London and places like that where, where they have similar meetings. And I met eventually at a conference in Spain, actually. Uh, I met the guy to whom that book is dedicated, um, Dr. Rory McSweeney, who's a great thinker about dreaming and consciousness and reality and so on and so forth. And um, we used to have long chats. And I think after one long chat going on into the small hours of the night about the double slit experiment and quantum physics and it's whether lucid dreams were really the quantum world which scientists tell us they can't possibly imagine, except we imagine it every night when we go to sleep, um, that I wrote him a comic email, you know, and then I developed that into a, a fable, a quantum fable, and, that, and Roy thought it was quite funny, so it was obviously okay to continue, so I wrote two more fables to go with that. And the third one always wanted to turn itself into a book, and eventually it did. And this is the book? <coughs> that's, that's the book, which actually incorporates the three fables in slightly different form. So is there a story in the book, or, or are you just trying to exemplify or uh, explain these? No, uh, no, there, there, there's a story. There, uh, you know, our scientists, let's say us here in this reality, uh, are building a machine. Um, which they don't actually know a great deal about because it's uh, the guy who's designed the whole thing got the idea in a dream. And that's, we can you know, <laughs> go on forever backwards in the plot to discover how that happened. But anyway, they decided to build this machine because it would test all their current theories about particles and string theory and all the rest of it. Um, but what they don't realize is actually it's going to bring time to a complete stop as a side effect. Because the maths isn't good enough, you see. The maths is full of approximations and, and probabilities and all the rest of it, and they just can't see what's really going to happen. Well, the dream world, people who live in the dream world can. Now, you've got to understand the dream world is real, mm -hmm. right? It's like the quantum world, and the people who live there are really real people, and they can see what's going to happen, and they don't like the idea 
because if the universe is going to end, then they're going to end as well. And so are the gods. The gods these days are a coalition government. Um, you know, as one of the characters in the book says, you know, that means complete mediocrity in, mediocrities in positions of power. We can't say that anymore, of course. But um, we're broadcasting <laughs> after the election, we should mention. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, they, they ask, they can't do anything because gods are not allowed to interfere because we've got free will and they're not allowed to tamper with that. So they ask the people in the dream world to help. And the problem that they have is they can send agents over here, just like we can visit them at night, but they can send agents over here, but they can't remember mm -hmm. once they get here what they're here to do. And so there's a lot of scope for a lot of silly things <laughs> to go on <laughs> while they try to solve the problem. And you, again, you don't quite know until the very end of the book who is actually who. You know who they appear to be, but where do they come from and who are they actually? You know, and mm. that I think I was quite surprised to find that people who've read it say, Oh, I didn't realise that so and so was actually so and so until the very end. I think, but well, it wasn't it obvious. I mean, I did try to mislead the reader, you know, with a few red herrings, but you mean you, you really didn't? No, no, I didn't. No, no. <laughs> it's quite, I'm quite well, pleasantly surprised. <laughs> if you can combine kind of, um, you know, this kind of fiction with detective fiction yeah. is, uh, is quite yeah. Well, it's a bit of a thriller and a bit of a whodunit, and it's a romance as well um, between the, 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 the chief scientist at the project and uh, a girl called Lucy who may or may not be who they appear to be. Mm -hmm. um, and that gets resolved in the end as well. I mean, I mentioned to Terry Pratchett and Douglas Adams in the introduction, but I'm reminded of a whole kind of tradition of, of, of kind of, all the way back to Plato, I think, in which kind of the whole nature of reality becomes the subject of, of, of the fiction. And as you're, you're kind of questioning this relationship, it begins to reflect back on your own experience. I, I, is, is that what you intended for the reader? Well, it does a bit. Um, uh, obviously, some of the things I say in there are things which I actually believe and a lot of things are things which I don't really necessarily believe. I always admire Terry Pratchett though, because he has this incredible gift or had this incredible gift of saying very serious things actually in a very funny way, mm. you know, gently in a very funny way. And I greatly admired that. Yeah. Uh, I can't write anything as well as that, frankly. <laughs> yeah, it's a great shame uh, that his loss. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. uh, but, but you're right, that, that tradition, I think, that, uh, and I've, it's probably some, partly to do with the science fiction tradition. Generally, you're trying to say interesting and useful <laughs> things about the world, but you're trying to tell a story as well. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's part of the fascination. So are you working on anything else at the moment? Well, I'm working on a sequel to that. Um, on about so 10, the world 10, survives, the universe that. survives. <laughs> um, well, we shouldn't give that away. Anyway, there's a sequel. <laughs> <laughs> or a um, prequel, perhaps. Yeah, I've actually got, got ideas for a plot for a third one as well, but um, I'm about 10,000 words into the sequel, which is quite complicated. I've got to be very, very careful in the sequel because the sequel is about changing the past, mm. you see, and so maybe nothing that happens in there actually happened. And that gets very difficult when you try to plot it out because you keep contradicting yourself. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm never convinced by, by those time traveling uh, um, shows or films or books that at some point it just becomes too complicated and things kind of well, disappear. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, if somebody changed the past, you'd remember it as the way that they changed it to, wouldn't you? So you wouldn't know it had been changed. <laughs> maybe it's already happened. Maybe it's happening now well, as we speak. Has, yeah. yeah. Well, would you? Would it? Would you actually ever remember it? I mean, supposing you went to change the past, and there you are. You sort of did something like you know, and pressed the save button, and there it was, save mm. changed. You've changed it. Now, can you remember what you were doing five minutes ago? I mean, you're talking about te technology there to a certain extent, well, but of course, <laughs> changing the past is what we do all do all the time, isn't it? Um, and, and you know, politicians and people have made a lot out of that uh, over, over the millennia and over the centuries. Well, yeah, uh, I mean, <laughs> if you don't know history, you're doomed to repeat it, um, which applies to most people. Politicians do know history and they're still doomed to repeat it most of the time. But um, I think uh, 
It's it's very difficult to actually think about. I mean, Einstein reckoned it was uh, it was paradoxical. You couldn't do it because it was a paradox. But one of the things I say in there, and I really do believe, is that what's wrong with the paradox? Nothing wrong with the paradox. It just means you have to believe two different things at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Which is what language seems spe specifically set up to do. Um, you know, I can say something, and you might not necessarily take it the way I, I meant. So we were kind of we're living out a paradox even as we speak and communicate. Yeah, well, well language straight away implies something is and at the same time something isn't, doesn't it? So language is immediately dualistic, yeah. um, which is a problem. Yeah. Um, and I have a lot of fun in there with uh, language, you know, because you have to use ordinary language. You have to use words like where and when and next and meanwhile. And of course, in a world like the dream world where there is no time, because if you think back to dreams, if, you, if, if you're a lucid dreamer, you can remember it, but if you think back to dreams, you have no consciousness of time, absolutely none. Mm -hmm. So there's no time in the dream world. So how can you use words like where and when and next and so forth? So I get quite a bit of fun out of that as well. Fun is an important part, isn't it, to, to maintain that some kind of perspective on these yeah, very I deep think, questions? I think fun is very fun. I, I mean, a few people have read that and have said, oh, I was laughing by the second page, and I think, oh, wow, gosh, <laughs> that's really nice. <laughs> I really like to hear that. Yeah, it is, it is nice. Isn't it? And uh, Terry Pratchett, of course, was, and Douglas Adams, they were the same. They, they yeah, wanted to make yeah. it. Well, thanks very much for joining us. Um, stay with us for part two when we meet the writer, illustrator, and editor behind the That Was series of books. The That Was collection of books is a range of fun history stories for children based on an eclectic series of historical places and events. We met up with the creative team involved to learn more. Well, I'm Mary Gonzalez, uh, and I'm the author, along with Joan. And I'm Joan Brickley. I'm also an author. Well, that was books. And I'm Joni, the coordinator, and I do Mary's typing for her after she'd done it in longhand. And we're sitting here one afternoon, and I spotted Joan to Victorian Dodd's house over there in the corner, and I thought I could write a little story about this. So I asked Joan for pen and paper, and I jotted down my ideas there and then. And the idea is where the two little children would go into the house, magically become small, and all the little figures would uh, come alive and they would experience Victorian times. There's a cook, the butler, the maid, the chimney sweep, and um, I thought we need a magic element in this now. So I thought of um, a magic dog with a magic fan that could whisk them back in time. So Joan and I call that Don Miranda, and she is in all our books. Uh, she's one of the main characters. She whips the children back into different centuries um, where they have adventures um, and we brought the grandmother into it as well, so it's family oriented. Uh, and then um, I showed Joan what I was writing and she said, oh I like this and um, I'll join in. So she put her ideas in with mine and we managed to get the Victorian Dolls House book out. That was the first, the first book. Um, we got that published. And, and there's a magic doll, and the magic doll takes these two twins back in time, magically. So they've been back to ancient Egypt and ancient Rome, and, um, even back to more modern times, like the 60s. So we've, we've varied the, the, you know, the, the stories that way. And we, at that stage, we still didn't say we'll write more books, you know. Um, it wasn't until six months later, I happened to go on the Mersey Ferry, and I thought, oh, we could write a book about the very first Mersey Ferry, putting in the same characters in. The children, the grandmother, the magic doll, and the magic doll could whisk them back to King John's days. And so I drafted the notes down, showed them to Joan, and again she put her ideas. <coughs> And we got that published, that was the, um, the Mercy Ferry that was. 
So I typed the books out and um, I sent them to the publishers to be published. Recently we've been writing books about villages. We've written um, the Everton village that was, the Bolton village that was, and the Nottyash village that was. Um, after that it just snowballed. Um, so I do all Mary's typing after she does it in one hand. And um, I help Joni with the coordination, Joan with the coordinating. A lot of the local people got to know about the stories and so they kept asking us about the stories and um, when would the next one come out. So we just seemed to write furiously after that, one book after another, and we decided to call them the That Was Books. So therefore that's why we call ourselves the That Was Group. Uh, Veronica Stevens from um, Writing to Radio uh, she's made some of the, be the books into audio. Um, it was The Kingdom That Was. It was The Kingdom That Was, The Drummer Boy. She did a great job of making audios for us out of the books. A lot of the books, um, we've got our inspiration from one, the places that we lived, places that we visited, because I went off to the Caribbean and we thought about the pirates in the Caribbean and we took the children back to the um, pirate, pirate times, the pirate that was. Um, since then we've um, had some dealings with St Vincent's School in Liverpool, St Vincent's School for the Pontially Sighted and um, the principal Dr Patterson asked us to write a book for the children. So while we were there we saw this old beech tree in the grounds and the beech tree was about 800 years old and it had been struck down by a storm. So we decided we'd write the book called The Beech Tree That Was and went through the different times of how, how people in different ages used the tree and, and then we went back to how Miranda was made, the, 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 she was carved from you know the branches of this tree and so on. So that book now um, has been put into Braille and Large Town. After we'd written this Beech Tree book we visited back at the school a while after and somebody, I don't know whether it's an one of the teachers or whoever it was in the school had sculpted out of the remainder of this beach trip the most beautiful carving of a girl reading a book and they, they made it into a little centre where the, the children can sit around in the summer and we called it Story Tree and there's now little doors in the tree because we've mentioned all these things haven't we? The, um, a witch in it and you know, just, we've just brought a little bit of magic in. Uh, recently we've been writing our own little stories for younger children, four to five year olds and uh, Jones are called Flip Flop, the rabbit and mine are Billy Beaver books. But we couldn't um, afford to pay for a professional illustrator so I have done art for a long time in an amateur way but I like painting. So we thought about if I did the, the pictures for the books. So I've done the illustrations for most of the books. Well, just recently we went to see a play called The White Rabbit and it was done by a really pro a professional group. Um, Christian group and after the play they saw our book called The Star That Was and it's like a Christmas story where the, the twins go back with Miranda back into time you know to the nativity they meet the shepherds and all that and they seem to like that so they said that they would like to, to make it into a play at the moment they're looking for some funding because they need it for the costumes and they're thinking of bringing some puppets in somehow. 
Um, they're very imaginative. So anyway, they're going to do this, we hope. And depending on whether they get enough funding, they'll put it on maybe for Christmas. Perhaps in the schools or various churches around. At some future date, we would like to get the, the doll manufactured uh, to be sold with the books. We think the children would love that. Uh, lots of the grandmothers love these books. Absolutely love them. We get good feedback from the grandmothers, don't we? Yes. So, um, Veronica's keen to make many more into audios for us. The first four books that I mentioned um, we've had put into one book now. So all four books are into one book and we've called it the collection of books. Uh, you can get the books from um, Central Library at Liverpool, um, Waterstones, uh, County Vice Publishers um, and of course our website which is www.sitethatwas.co.uk Wigan Youth Drama School um, had the children performing the pirates and the smuggler that was. Um, grandson was only 10 and he performed in that play. Uh, but it was really good. Um, so we'd like to see some more of the books getting turned into plays. Yes. Hopefully one day we'll go on cinema. <laughs> Cartoons. <laughs> That's what we're hoping for. If you have any comments or suggestions for the show, Please contact us at artsalivebooks at baytvliverpool.com and we look forward to hearing from you. See you on the next edition of Arts Alive Books. Good night.